Thank you very much for the invitation, and uh, I'm an old hand uh, in this field, in a way. I was once chairman of the European movement here in Oslo. That was back 25 years ago when I was a student, at the time when there were still some of these uh, uh, old uh, Håkon Lee um, a sort of uh, lieutenants who called me and didn't really like this young academic female <laughs> who was in this position. And I have been an ardent supporter of EU membership for Norway for, for all those years and follow the EU uh, and taught on the EU. Uh, and therefore, uh, I think we can, say, we can start by saying that crises uh, is usually a, a good trigger for EU activity. Uh, the EU prospers, uh, gets its act together when we have crises. Yet today in Europe, as uh, the minister said, we have a sort of legion crises of various kinds, both security uh, and economic crises. So I'm in this curious position then of having uh, the preceding speaker, uh, the acting politician, giving the diagnosis and the academic perhaps <laughs> trying to provide a cure. Uh, let that be as it may, uh, I would like to uh, start by saying, uh, should the EU dem be democratic, or why on earth should the EU be democratic? Why do we ask that question? We don't ask, is NATO democratic? Is the UN democratic? Is the Council of US U Europe democratic? We have about 250 international organizations uh, where most states are members, and we never pose the question of democracy uh, because we don't expect them to be democratic. They are the, ne the main model, namely intergovernmental, uh, interstatal organizations when the where the democratic legitimacy uh, of the mandate for the ministers, for the foreign minister usually, or the defense minister is taken care of at home here in Oslo, uh, in Copenhagen, in London and so on. And that's the main model. So, in fact, uh, it's a question to pose why we should think that the EU should be democratic. Because by that we say that the EU is not an intergovernmental organization, uh, it is something else. And that something else, I think, is the problem. Uh, because uh, we have basically two types of uh, organizations. Uh, one is intergovernmental, no democratic problem, because the mandate is what you get up here in the Foreign Office, and it is based on the Norwegian Parliament's uh, democratic procedure of uh, selecting a government. So the government uh, is the guarantee of the, that the mandate is arrived at through a democratic procedure. Uh, the other model is federal. It is uh, a type of political organization uh, where democratic legitimacy uh, is had um, uh, through at least four layers of organization uh, of decision making, local, regional, uh, national and supranational. And if the EU were uh, a federal structure, which it isn't, uh, then one would have uh, a much stronger role for the European Parliament. There would be uh, much more power vested in the Parliament, much less power vested in the Swedish or Danish Parliaments, to, to speak of member states. So I think the problem uh, really arises from this hybrid uh, type of organization that the EU has become, and that is a problem uh, itself. Now, let me uh, say something about uh, democratic criteria. What should we expect? What's the most important criterion of a democracy? In my view, it is and has always to be accountability, recall, uh, checks and balance. The fact that we as citizens, uh, we elect somebody, we can uh, expect them to represent us in what they do. They are our agents. We are the principles, the old word for prince, princeps. We are the principles, we elect them, they are our agents. Uh, and if we don't like what they do, if they mismanage, if they don't do as they should, we recall them in the next election. So they have a pressure on them. We watch them. We follow them. They do work for us. Uh, and uh, this is the backbone of any democracy. If you recall the Boston Tea Party, 
uh, it was about taxation. No taxation without representation. We do not accept to pay taxes to this king in Britain when we are not represented at the table. And at the nation state, the, the key social contract involves the duty of taxation, which you know never disappears. The only certain thing in life are death and taxes. I think Keynes said that. Uh, and we also had duties to die for the country, for instance, in this country's uh, newly re sort of uh, reformed constitution, which we celebrate to this year in 200 years old constitution, it still says that you now have a duty to die for Norway if need be. This is the conscription. So taxation, conscription, pretty heavy duties. And we accept this because we have a social contract. We ex expect the state uh, to deliver back those that act on our behalf. So accountability, recall, transparency, the key democratic um, principles. Without those, we cannot talk of a democracy. And I think this is, uh, this is why there will never be any supranational democracy on the scale of the EU or beyond a certain size of the political unit. The Greek city-state was a small unit almost perfect democracy perhaps, at least a, sm a rather small unit. We have nation states, bigger units, but to think of any supranational European democracy with uh, common language, common public sphere, common public debate is impossible. And that, this is why the European Parliament remains such a problem from a democratic point of view. And I will develop this. Uh, let us uh, step back and look at the problems again. Uh, in the UK, I was in Britain last, uh, last week, and they have, of course, a sort of a very, uh, should one say, populist debate in the press, uh, increasingly also in politics, which is not uh, representative of the real issues, but we have sort of we and them, uh, we, they are the ones beyond uh, overseas, meaning on the other side of the channel, they are Europe, we are Britain, uh, we can never meet in a sense. Uh, but the Brits also have a very solid democratic uh, type of debate, more sophisticated than in most countries. Uh, if you follow The Economist, uh, read Financial Times and so on, you see that uh, there's a sophistication to these issues that we lack in our debates very much. We don't talk very much about the basic principles. Uh, when uh, the British recognize that uh, clearly there must be international conventions and organizations, but they also insist that there must be a basic uh, recall mechanism that uh, sovereignty uh, belongs to the state. Uh, and this is also what states, when pushed, uh, will in a way uh, underline, for instance, the German Constitutional Court in Karlsruhe in 1989, when we had a treaty on political union, stated that wir sind die Herren der Verträge. The member states are the masters of the treaties. We decide. We decide whether we want this court, whether we want this parliament, whether we want this commission. And we can recall and change all those institutions. Now, institutions, as you all know, uh, live a life on their own. Once they have a budget, once they have uh, some kind of mandate, once they have uh, uh, been set up. So international organizations do not disappear, apart from the Warsaw Pact, it's the only one that has disappeared, and the Western Union, which was, uh, came into the EU. Uh, but I think uh, this is a time ripe for reform of European Union institutions. Uh, and let me explain why. The Commission, uh, we know that the Commission and the Court, they have these very sensible and strong tools of uh, correcting, of criticizing, of punishing behavior that is not in line with the treaties. Infringement proceedings, the Court can give verdicts, but we also can look statistically at the number of infringement proceedings and court rulings uh, and actions by the Commission, it waxes and wanes. It is up in periods where the EU is a success, it is down in periods when it is not. So the, exactly at this time, 
where the Commission ought to act, like in the Hungarian case and other cases, the Commission ought to stand up uh, very much clearly for these uh, values of the Copenhagen criteria, democracy, rule of law, etc. The Commission is quite quiet. Uh, so this is a problem, because uh, when we have these institutions, we expect them to act in the interest of all states according to these rules. Uh, and today we live in an age of, of, of frugality economically, austerity, new public management. Uh, it will be quite uh, good if one would say, do we need this large commission? Uh, couldn't it be slimmed down? Is there really... Are they acting in the sort of interest of the Council, the European Council, which gives the strategic direction, uh, like in NATO, like in the UN, uh, you know, large bureaucracies, uh, they can be uh, definitely be uh, uh, kept on their toes much more, they can be probably slimmed down, one can save money. All of this unpleasantness, uh, I think, is necessary. One is it's necessary, as they do now in NATO. Do we need 6,000 officers working in shape? Probably not. Uh, or do we? I mean, looking at uh, bureaucr international bureaucracies and see what do we really need? Are we willing to pay these budgets? Are they effective? All the new public management stuff, all these uh, mechanisms for control, I think they should be used much more in international organizations. Because this is what citizens ultimately expect. When you go back in the chain of command, you get to the national democratic legitimacy. Uh, and then one should uh, look at the various EU institutions. Uh, the Council and the Court uh, and the Commission, the three Cs, very important. They are not supranational as such, although they have there are some policy areas that are supranational, but states have decided that we want a functioning court that can police the internal market rules. It's important that that court is not widening its mandate by self-widening uh, its jurisdiction too much. Uh, there is important scholarship on how uh, the court has constituted itself as a new order of international law back in the 60s, uh, Van Genden laws, Costa versus NL, two judgments from 63, 64 that nobody noticed at the time. By now, the court is supranational, over accepted by all national courts, and I think by Norwegian courts as well, although they don't want to <laughs> say it very, uh, very clearly. But I think that's a, that's, a, that's a thing that states accept. We have other international courts, human rights, um, the Court of Justice in The Hague, uh, the uh, ICC in The Hague, and the European Court in Luxembourg. And as long as this functions as a system of policing that's, that rules are followed, it is in the interest of all member states. Likewise, the Commission, if it does its, its work, if it doesn't sort of live a life of its own, uh, then the Council of Ministers will be happy to have these, this institution. Now we get to the EP, uh, which I think is the most problematic from the democratic point of view. Because here is a parallel parliament. I re recall uh, Suisse, the former Norwegian PM from the Conservatives, he talked about these parliamentary assemblies that international organizations have. Uh, Council of Europe, uh, the um, Nordic Council, uh, etc. We have usually a parliamentary assembly, NATO. And he talked about interplanetary union as a joke. <laughs> it was a great pun. That these parliamentarians are sort of out there just following the organizations that they are, they are attached to, but without any real power. So they are sort of, they have an interparliamentary union, and he called it an interplanetary union. Now, the European Parliament is the opposite. Uh, it was like that. It was a, a body without power, uh, and now it is a body with considerable power over the budget, over the commission, over the, uh, and over the directives. Uh, it has co-decision. And when you look at uh, them from the point of view of accountability, whom do they represent? They are voted in by national states, by uh, uh, sort of parties in national states, but they are not representing 
uh, nation states. On the contrary, they're representing some kind of vague European ideology, interest, whatever. So you vote them in, uh, not many people are interested, about 40%. They do as they please, they cost a lot of money, and they have a lot of power. So I'm provocative now because it sounds uh, odd, doesn't it, to criticize a parliament. But I think one could, in a way, uh, consider scrapping the whole European parliament because they are not accountable uh, in according to the main uh, criteria of democracy. And I believe that the EU will have to go in the direction of serving member states much more directly and clearly of not believe there will not be a federal Europe. Spinelli <laughs> thought so many years ago, uh, but uh, the, mo the method that prevailed was Monet's method, pragmatic economic uh, cooperation. It was not uh, federalism. And today the EU is a hybrid, and that's its problem. So uh, to sum up, uh, international organizations are not democratic and are not meant to be. So that's the main rule. They are intergovernmental. The democratic issue is taken care of at home. Uh, and this is the main organizing principle, isn't it, of the EU as well. It is the states that determine the treaties, and they do so one by one. In a, uh, they have uh, equal voting rights. Uh, the, no, they don't have equal voting weights, but they are, all have to agree to treaty changes. They all have to agree to enlargement and so on. Uh, so it is the Council and their two main organizations within the EU, the uh, Weberian Democracy, Meritocracy, the Commission, and the Court uh, that serve, in a way, the machinery, that are the main machinery. Uh, and the EU being a hybrid means that it, it won't be democratically legitimated through a federal structure. There won't be these layers, this uh, competence catalogue that the Germans always have wanted, although we have uh, a strong federal, uh, f federal representatives as in the member, member state groups. I mean, the US is a federation. The EU is not like the US. Uh, and there are Germany as a federation and so on. Uh, but I think just the sheer size of, or the, the impossibility of having a public sphere with debate, recall, accountability, uh, will forever make it impossible to have a European democracy at the Brussels level. Uh, because uh, we don't have federations uh, in the member states. And then the European Parliament uh, then becomes an anomaly. Maybe not so important, but it is a big, uh, it's a big part of the cost of the EU. Uh, the Commission and the Court, however, are fully, are fully uh, compatible with uh, national demo democratic principles. Uh, and I think they, are, um, they have siblings in other courts, in other organizations, because today we do not face any possibility of returning, thank God, to the traditional nation state with strong national interests, with close borders and so on. Although we face the competition from the old realpolitik nationalist thinking that we see uh, resurfacing in Hungary, for instance, in, certainly in Russia, in, uh, in other states. So Europe remains uh, an experiment that is uh, unique, unfortunately more and more uh, unique. Uh, so in a way, we can't, uh, we can't in a way, uh, base the future on this kind of confederal or whatever we should call this system. Uh, I think that uh, a more intergovernmental EU is, uh, is the only future because democracy must be strengthened uh, at the national level. And this is also pushed very much now by these nationalist groups, populism, uh, the fear of too much immigration, the fear of the internal market and so on. Uh, there has to be much more political will at the national level to retain uh, the useful parts of the EU and to be willing to be critical 
uh, of uh, the use of money, of the role of other institutions. So I think we are in a crisis situation, clearly, uh, but there's no return to sort of, we don't dismantle the EU, but there has to be a critical look uh, and there has to be a real will to, uh, to maintain and police, in a way, the rule of law uh, and so on. The EU Commission has to be leaner and meaner, maybe at least tougher, the court as well, because the, the tools are there, but they are not used. And if the EU cannot, in a way, serve European states uh, in a good manner, uh, there will be more of of the same crisis. And there is, I think, at, at, at present, unfortunately, such a lack of political will. It is now that the EU should be much uh, clearer about its ability to act, uh, because the main principles are at stake with Russia, uh, with populism in member states, uh, and those main principles are linked to democracy. They're not called democracy, but if you look at the UN Pact, 2.3, it says conflicts must be resolved peacefully among states. Peaceful conflict resolution, not arms. It is uh, illegal, it says in 2.4, to threaten or to use force uh, among states. These are the principles of the UN Pact, the key, sort of the Bible of international affairs. And they presuppose some kind of democratic uh, virtue in, in politicians. And we see now, as the minister said, we are, we are facing the unpeaceful uh, management of conflict. Uh, we are seeing interference uh, in internal affairs uh, through manipulation and threats. Uh, this is Russia, of course. So the key principles that are so intimately linked to democracy are at stake in Europe. And at this time, the EU Commission uh, the court, but particularly the commission, should be much more forward-leaning, uh, saying that we, our founding principles are exactly those, and we will make sure that all members follow the rules. Uh, because uh, uh, if you show sort of, if you don't act in action, uh, as was mentioned, the cost of inaction is uh, at this time, I think, critically high. Uh, I will uh, stop now because, uh, like Ronald Reagan said, time flies when you're having fun. He was then president of the US, uh, and I tend to talk too much or for too long, but uh, I think you are the boss, you're boss of the time. I think you were talking too much, actually. I think it was quite fascinating to listen to you. Uh, it was a bit of a sort of... Um, rather melancholy at the bottom of your voice in a way because I mean <laughs> saying what you said about the European Parliament you surely are sort of moving away from the basic ideals of what it was all about. Mm -hmm. So if I understood you right, what you're actually saying is that the forces of nation nationalism is still so strong that the European identity, which should be the driving force be behind a, a joint sort of European <coughs> Parliament, is not there. Yes, I think that's... Uh uh, I think it's, um, uh, and f I mean, what we see, uh, it shouldn't surprise us that national identity is the key identity. Uh, it is our key identity, all of us. Um, it is where we pay taxes, it is where we get welfare goods, it is uh, where we mostly, uh, in a way, have our, uh, have our uh, daily lives. Uh, so that shouldn't be in a contrast to being European. And I'm a very European person myself, uh, being married to uh, somebody from, from the outskirts of Europe, so to speak, <laughs> a Hungarian, came here as a refugee, as a young boy. Uh, so I'm uh, very, very much of a European enthusiast. But I realize that we cannot believe that um, we can build a pan-European uh, organization that is also democratic. Uh, I mean, one has to be realistic about this, that uh, uh, there is no, um, there's no possibility of uh, a democracy at the European level. It doesn't mean that we cannot share the idea of a common European identity. We have the internal market and these freedoms, a great accomplishment. Uh, but I don't think we will have a political union. There won't be a political union 
uh, with um, a much more power at the European level. Uh, so it isn't, uh, I, I don't think we will see a federal Europe, although I would personally not mind it at all. No, I see. <laughs> so it's a matter of putting your finger down into the earth to smell where you are in a way. Thank you so much. Thank you.